previous video, we covered a period of three centuries in the evolution of the modern international system, in which the configuration of power in that system periodically shifted. The lesson from that story was that these changes were precipitated by great power wars, which ushered in new dominant states and new configurations of power. Also, this international system of sovereign states itself was expanded in size from a European regional system to a truly international order that now spans the entire world. And this was the result of waves of colonial expansion by European states in the Americas, Asia and Africa. The story I'll share with you in this video is a different story. This is the story of the era of American hegemony, of the period from 1945 to today, of the United States as the world's most powerful state. First in the bipolar world order of the Cold War, and then as the preeminent state in a unipolar world order. But it's also a story about cycles and the approaching end of US hegemony, as we see rising powers and new global commons problems emerge. To tell that story in this video, I'll recap our key ideas of balance of power and hegemony. Then we'll explore four key power configurations of the post-World War II era. So this is the Cold War, globalization, and the rise and decline of the United States. I'll conclude by framing these in the context of hegemonic cycles as an explanation for structural change in the international system. So what we'll ultimately arrive at across the two videos this week is both an origin story for the modern system of sovereign states, as well as a model of how and why the international system itself changes over time. In the first video this week, and as I'll reinforce in this one, the international system of sovereign states has evolved over time, along with the distribution of power between states within that system. So how do we make sense of this? There are periods of time where that distribution of power is multipolar, where three or more great powers are preeminent, but without any one of them dominating. There's times when the system is bipolar, where two states more or less equally dominate. And then there's periods of unipolarity where one state dominates the global system. When the international system is in a period of unipolarity, the dominant state is known as the hegemon and their period of dominance is called hegemony. A hegemon is the leading state in the international system and as the leading state, it enjoys what we call structural power. So this means that the hegemonic state has the capacity to exert primacy and authority over other states and to essentially write the rules of the game, designing the architecture of institutions in the international system to its own benefit. So in essence, hegemony is a system of power that extends beyond the hegemonic state itself. And it's a system that defines how other states exist in relationship to the hegemonic power and in relationship with each other. With that in mind, here are some key features that characterize a hegemonic state. The hegemon is the dominant military power. They have a large economy and they're an engine of technological innovation. The hegemon has strong and stable domestic political institutions that are the anchor of its projection of power and systemic dominance. The hegemon sits at the center of an international system of rules and institutions through which it exercises economic and strategic power. Of course, it's not all about coercion, though. A strong hegemon is all about attracting other states to bandwagon under its power. The hegemonic order provides public goods for other states. So a rules-based order, for example, provides benefits to other states as well as to the hegemon. So it's an attractor. A hegemon also webs together the international system within a transnational culture through its soft power, which legitimizes its leadership and dominance. Back into the historical timeline now and examine the Cold War. 
In general, Cold Wars are periods of intense competition between two great powers, during which time they're restrained from fighting against each other directly. The Cold War during the latter half of the 20th century between the United States and the Soviet Union gets its name from that general definition. So what was the nature of this competition between the US and the USSR? What prevented this Cold War from going hot? And what does the Cold War reflect about the nature of the international system itself? Despite being allies of convenience against Nazi Germany in World War II, the US and the Soviet Union were actually antagonists from the very moment of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1919. This antagonism stemmed from the fundamentally incompatible ideologies, political systems and economies of the two states, and the threat to the legitimacy and stability of each other's political systems as posed by the other. These were essentially two different and mutually exclusive visions for how to organise society, and both were premised on the rejection of the other. The Cold War essentially divided the world into two distinct economic systems, or what we could describe as two different operating systems for economic activity. These economic operating systems had different interpretations for how to produce goods and services and for how to manage labour and resources. They had different arrangements for money and finance and different legal frameworks for regulating economic activity. The United States had become the centre of global capitalism and its operating system was based on markets, private property ownership and profit maximisation. By contrast, the USSR was founded from the Bolshevik Revolution in 1919 as a rejection of capitalism and an attempt to implement a different operating system for the economy. The Soviet model of communism was based on the command economy central planning of all economic activity by the state bureaucracy and state ownership over all property and means of production. Because of their shared mistrust, the two superpowers engaged in intense military competition. And while they never fought each other directly, they both engaged in an intense arms race. Both superpowers built up their conventional military forces and armaments, built by extensive military industrial complexes, and financed by enormous military budgets. Was Cold War arms racing more conspicuous or more dangerous than in the proliferation of nuclear weapons? From the moment the USSR tested its first nuclear weapon in 1949, not long after the United States had attacked Japan with atomic weapons in 1945, both superpowers rapidly expanded their stockpiles of nuclear warheads to maintain parity with each other. Both superpowers also demonstrated their nuclear weapons technologies by conducting thousands of nuclear weapons tests. And they conducted these on the ground, underground, underwater, and high in the atmosphere. We tend to take it for granted now, but it can't be understated just how jarring the advent of nuclear weapons was during the Cold War. Leaders and policymakers had to adjust to the unprecedented challenge of, man of managing weapons with the capability of destroying all life on Earth in the advent of nuclear war. The incredible destructive power of nuclear weapons, as you can see here, and the enormous nuclear weapons capabilities that both superpowers possessed, ironically helped reduce some of the risk of either superpower directly attacking each other. However, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis proved that nuclear war was only a decision or a mistake or a miscalculation away. And this event ended up proving to be the impetus for the moderation of Cold War strategic nuclear competition and the initiation of institutional arrangements to manage nuclear weapons proliferation. The superpowers also began to acknowledge their shared interest in preventing localised proxy wars around the world from escalating into a larger superpower war that could go nuclear. The US and USSR maintained alliance blocks with allied states, 
which effectively divided the world into two opposing camps. For its part, the US alliance bloc consisted of the states of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, in Western Europe and North America, along with its bilateral alliances with Japan and South Korea and Australia, among others, in Asia. The Soviet Union maintained the Warsaw Pact with its allies in Eastern Europe, along with relationships with other states across the broader communist bloc, including North Korea, Cuba, North Vietnam, and at least initially, the People's Republic of China. The alliance blocs were not just military. The deeper rationale for the superpowers was to ensure that as many states as possible were incorporated into the economic system of their superpower patron. While the superpowers never fought each other directly, they were involved in a number of proxy wars across the world throughout the Cold War. So these proxy wars were essentially localised conflicts that assumed a larger importance to the superpowers in the context of their ideological competition and competing alliance blocs. So why then would the superpowers get enmeshed in fighting these local conflicts? This is where the post-World War II retreat of the European colonial powers and the wave of decolonization comes into the picture in the context of the Cold War. Now, there are a number of reasons why decolonization took off at this time. And of course, the obvious driving force was that colonised peoples didn't want to stay colonised. Self-determination was an important political ideal in international relations throughout the 20th century, and it definitely took root in the colonies and fed resistance movements. But those resistance movements had existed for decades. What changed post-World War II was the window of political opportunity. So in this time, the old European empires were beginning to crumble. And so this ushered in the emergence of many new states who became independent in this wave of decolonization. The European colonial powers were financially and militarily exhausted after the war, and they couldn't maintain the huge costs of maintaining their colonial possessions in faraway corners of the globe. Also, public opinion within Europe began to turn against colonial domination, so there was some domestic pressure there. For its part, the new United Nations began to support decolonization, and this provided an air of international legitimacy to national self-determination. Nonetheless, though, national self-determination and independence struggles became coloured by the ideological competition of the Cold War, and this led to new flashpoints. The United States pressured the European colonial powers into divesting themselves of their colonies with a view to incorporating the newly decolonized states into its free world capitalist alliance bloc. On the other hand, the Soviet Union offered newly independent states a different vision for their societies based on the Soviet model of communism and command economies. And we need to remember that in the 1950s and 60s, Communism was still seen as an, as an attractive alternative model for nation building and for economic development by many people in decolonized states under the banner of anti-imperialism. It was common in post-colonial nations that independence movements would end up fracturing into factions that would vie, vie for control over their new state. And so when that would happen, the superpowers would support one or the other of these rival factions in a, in a bid to incorporate the new state into their alliance bloc. Similarly, the superpowers often became involved in backing status quo or pro-independence rivals, respectively, in conflicts in colonies that were yet to become independent. So, for example, France tried in vain to hold on to its colonies and it fought bitter wars in Algeria and Vietnam to keep them, although they lost on both occasions. The United States became involved in Vietnam immediately following the French withdrawal, ostensibly to keep Vietnam from falling to the communists. The US also intervened in wars in Greece and Korea and engineered coups in several other countries. The Soviets supported communist allies in Korea, Cuba and Vietnam, along with several post-colonial struggles in Africa 
that crushed anti-communist uprisings in its East European satellite states, and later in the Cold War launched its ill-fated invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, a war that ushered in four decades of ongoing violence in that country. left numerous legacies on and within the international system. So for one, decolonization and post-colonial independence saw a wave of new states become part of the international system. So this was the final step in the incorporation of regions outside of Europe into what was originally a European international system of sovereign states. The Cold War also had ongoing impacts within the societies of the superpowers. So, for example, in the United States, the cementing of the permanent war economy and the expansion of its global military footprint was accompanied by anti-war protests and the birth of contemporary social movements. And this coalesced particularly during the time of the Vietnam War and the world revolutions of 1968, as described by world systems theorist Emmanuel Wallerstein. So movements for civil rights and racial justice, second wave feminism, environmentalism, queer movements, among others. All of these were born in this period and they continue to leave an imprint today, despite its authoritarian political system, or perhaps even because of it. The USSR also faced grassroots change and resistance. The command economy had steadily decayed under its own inefficiencies for several decades. Moscow's disastrous war in Afghanistan also became a huge drain on the state during the 1980s, on top of decades of costly arms racing with the United States. During the 1980s, the Soviet leadership under new leader Mikhail Gorbachev attempted a series of economic and political reforms known as Perestroika and Glasnost. Under the policy of Perestroika, the Soviet leadership undertook to loosen the command economy system while also beginning to democratize some of the institutions of the state. Perestroika was accompanied by the policy of Glasnost, which allowed for greater freedom of speech, which Gorbachev hoped would help make Perestroika more successful. These reforms did not go as planned. The opening for freedom of speech opened an avalanche of public criticism of the Soviet state. Just as the economic reforms of perestroika were starting to undermine the centralized control of the government, and so all of this eroded public confidence in the state. There was too much change all at once, which the very brittle Soviet political and economic system was unable to accommodate without fracturing. So this is what opened the space for protest and rebellion in the USSR's satellite states in Eastern Europe, which led to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and eventually to the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself in 1991. This is the original Tank Man photo from the Tiananmen Square uprising in Beijing in 1989. And not a lot of people have actually seen this wider angle shot. Usually it's the close up uh, of Tank Man in front of that first tank. But uh, when you see this original shot, you can see the magnitude of the action that that person took. But what this symbolizes when we draw back from Tank Man, what we're seeing is that the People's Republic of China was facing its own systemic crisis at this time as well, which culminated in the Tiananmen Square uprising of 1989. However, unlike in Eastern Europe, the Chinese government brutally suppressed this popular protest movement and took the longer term lesson from the Soviet experience that political change should never be attempted at the same time as economic reform. China has reformed its economic system extensively to now become the, the leading power in the global capitalist economy today. While on the other hand, the USSR no longer exists. For the United States, victory in the Cold War saw much hubris about the superiority of liberal democracy and capitalism. Most famously encapsulated at the time, in a book by liberal theorist Francis Fukuyama called The End of History and the Last Man.
There was much talk of peace dividends, of the economic benefits of not having to engage in the costly arms race. The peace dividend turned out to be untrue. The US found itself in a unipolar moment as the world's sole superpower. Cold War coincided with the acceleration of globalization. Now, the significance of globalization is a source of much disagreement and much contestation between different theoretical perspectives within IR. So, for example, from an economic perspective, globalization is a process by which national economies have been absorbed into an interlocking global economy. And that economic globalization is characterized by mutual dependence among state and non-state actors. Political globalization is about the integration of states into international multilateral institutions. And then there's proponents of the hyper-globalization thesis who suggests that globalization has been such a fundamental and transformative force in IR that it represents the emergence of a global society and the death knell of the nation state. Now, all of the perspectives on globalization have some merits, they all have some limitations. So let's dive into this. What we can say with some confidence is that globalization as a system is a framework of accelerated networked transnational interaction. And as a system of networked processes and interactions, it's been facilitated by three important sets of technologies. First, there has been the availability of cheap fossil fuel energy, which has enabled transnational air and shipping transit, slashing transit times to a fraction of what they were prior to the second half of the 20th century. Transportation technologies and logistics networks have themselves involved to incredible scale. So for example, see the size of container ships now as evidence of this. And finally, the rapid advances in information technology since the 1970s have been pivotal in facilitating an unprecedented real-time connectivity at global scale. So these three technological advances have enabled a level of global complex interconnection, interaction and exchange that really is unprecedented in the human experience. Globalization has been made possible because of US hegemony. The US Navy and Air Force keep the seas safe and open for the passage of global trade. Now wars and geopolitical stresses and even piracy of the high seas variety are bad for business because they physically block the flow of goods and capital. So the hegemonic power is able to provide the security that enables the unimpeded integration of the global economy. But the global hegemon also provides the economic operating system for globalization to occur. The American post-1945 hegemonic order is based on a number of institutional pillars for managing the economic architecture. So these include the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the WTO, which emerged from the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. So these institutions form the architecture for the hegemonic economic order, and were designed initially with the United States as their primary leader and beneficiary. The policy formula for integrating other states into this economic system has been known as the Washington Consensus. And this, the Washington Consensus consists of a number of different key points. You can see these illustrated on the slide here, but just to summarize, these include opening economies to foreign investment, privatization of state-owned firms, the fire sale of state assets to private companies, getting rid of any laws that restrict the movement of capital, accepting development loans from the World Bank and IMF, et cetera, et cetera. So the Washington consensus model has both turbocharged and been turbocharged by globalization also be able to project a set of ideas to the world that legitimizes its domination and it encourages other states and peoples to bandwagon with hegemonic power.
to want to be a part of the hegemonic order. So this set of ideas and cultural products is called soft power, which was an idea popularized in the 1990s by American theorist Joseph Nye. The globalization of US soft power through the transmission of ideas and meanings and values around the world has extended the scope and scale of its hegemonic power and has created a common global culture through popular media consumption. A less benign interpretation would be to call this cultural imperialism and that this global culture erases local cultures and identities. But let's look at the winners and losers of globalization. Transnational economic integration has benefited many people, particularly in the countries of the global north. It's lifted millions of people out of poverty in newly industrialized countries. And it's enabled the emergence of a transnational group of cosmopolitan citizens of the world, if you like, who share common values across and above national sentiment. However, the benefits of globalization have not been evenly distributed and national sentiment still dies hard. International organizations and powerful non-state actors like multinational corporations have come to exercise jurisdiction within the domestic politics of states, often to significant public pain and backlash. Another important impact has been rising economic inequality both between states and within states as a direct result of the Washington consensus economic model. Widespread feelings of political disenfranchisement and economic precarity have been important factors in the rise of both left and right wing populist, nationalist and social movements in states across the world. We see it in movements from Occupy Wall Street, Wall Street and the Arab Spring to Brexit and Trumpism and many other movements worldwide. But I'm sure this isn't news to you. The fractious politics that we're living in today is deeply enmeshed in the globalization project and the broader reaction to it. The irony of globalization during the American unipolar moment over the turn of the millennium is that this order enabled the rise of China as a serious challenger to US hegemonic power. The US courted China in the 1970s as an ally against the Soviet Union, cemented by the opening of US markets to Chinese imports. China reformed its economy during the 1980s under Deng Xiaoping and stayed the course with economic liberalization through the 1990s under Jiang Zemin rapidly expanding its export sector and integrating into international economic institutions. Under President Hu Jintao in the 2000s, China began exporting its own economic development model abroad through what was known as the Beijing Consensus, which was an alternative to the develop model, development model offered by the United States. And from 2012 onward, China under Xi Jinping has become the world's preeminent economic power. Hegemonic transition theorists argue that a rising hegemonic challenger state is able to rise by bandwagoning within the existing hegemonic order. The challenger state has the advantage of being able to concentrate on growing its economy, while the existing hegemon has to take on the military responsibility and the associated costs of policing the international system and keeping that global economy functioning and open. So as a challenger, this is exactly what China has been able to do since 1979, being able to concentrate on growing its economy without having any of the associated military costs. However, to become the new hegemon, sooner or later, the economic interests of the challenger state will become global and those interests abroad will require defending. A hegemonic state therefore requires a military capability to match its economic power and with power projection capacity to defend those broader interests. For its part, China is currently modernizing and expanding its military capabilities 
along with its ability to project military power further abroad from its own territory. But across most measures of military power, China still lags behind the United States, though that gap is closing. There's further evidence for China as a hegemonic challenger in the areas in which it's challenging the status quo of American hegemony. China has created an alternative vision for economic development and integration in the Belt and Road Initiative, along with alternative financial institutions, including the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank and other institutions. It's increasingly engaged in more aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy, which is so named after the Wolf Warrior movie franchise. And so Wolf Warrior diplomacy is characterized by coercive tactics like hostage diplomacy and open ideological confrontation with the US and its allies. China is also expanding its international military footprint with a new string of bases in the Indian Ocean Basin, along with its frenetic island building activity in the South China Sea. China is clearly rising as a great power, but is the United States in decline as the global hegemon? The topic of American hegemonic decline has been postulated since at least the Vietnam War. It was signaled as a coming possibility since 9-11, and it's been debated as a reality since the global financial crisis. But what do we mean by the phrase hegemonic decline? Are we talking about a relative decline? Which means that US power remains stable, but challenger states are catching up. So that argument's been made since 2000 as China has risen in prosperity and power. Conversely, are we talking about absolute decline? Which means US power itself is in decay at the same time as other states catch up. My view is that the US is showing signs of absolute decline, both in terms of its ability to project military, economic and political power at a global level, as well as in the decay of its institutions and crumbling social fabric domestically. So this means we appear to be immersed in a period of accelerating hegemonic crisis. And the key question moving forward is how this hegemonic transition might unfold. And this is a critical question for analysts and practitioners of international relations in today's world. An important pattern that I hope has materialized for you as you've worked through this week's videos is that hegemony is a cyclical phenomenon. So as the graphics here illustrate, the power of the hegemonic state goes through phases of rise, domination and decline. Over time, an existing distribution of power in the international system comes under stress and it eventually breaks down. Dominant powers lapse into decay while other powers rise to challenge, eventually leading to a new great conflict. In hegemonic cycles, great power were Great power wars do occur periodically that irrevocably change the old political order. Rulers fall, states collapse, political systems change, economic systems transform, and new powers rise. So this is clearly what we could see looking back on World Wars I and II, and also looking back at the period immediately following the Napoleonic Wars. The victors developed new rules to keep the peace. They developed new institutions, norms and principles for the international system. We saw this after World War I with the establishment of the League of Nations and again after World War II with the establishment of the UN, NATO and the Bretton Woods Economic Institutions in the West and the Warsaw Pact in the Communist Bloc. Also, it's in the periods leading up to and immediately following Great Power Wars so between phases where one hegemonic power dominates, that the international system is most likely to be bipolar or multipolar in its distribution of power. Three points I'd like to make here to contextualize the link between hegemony, colonialism, and the expansion of the sovereign state system across the world. In the immediate aftermath of the great power conflict at the end of each new hegemonic cycle, 
A new hegemonic system emerges with rules and institutions that benefit the new dominant state. The world's most prosperous and powerful country in the 16th century was not in Europe, it was Ming Dynasty China. So this highlights the Eurocentrism of traditional IR discourses, which often don't consider regions beyond Europe until they become incorporated into the European state system. Portugal, Spain and the Netherlands were the first major European colonial nations. Their hegemonic period in the 16th century was financed by wealth extracted from their colonies in South America, Africa and Southeast Asia. When Great Britain and France became the most powerful countries in the system, that also occurred on the back of colonial expansion into North America, then later India, Africa and Australia. In the second half of the 19th century, when Britain was the hegemonic power, its great challenger after 1870 was Germany. And that, of course, led up to the 30 years crisis of the two world wars. Now, my final observation here is that there are many different scholarly perspectives on what drives hegemonic cycles. What we've covered here is a brief introduction to illustrate the forces of constant change in the international system, but there's obviously much deeper you can dive into this question. And of course, please do pause the video here to take a look at the information on these graphics. There's rich information on this particular slide. The field of international relations has blossomed to include a number of different theories about how the international system works and how the actors within it should conduct themselves in the interests of peace and stability. There are also systems of political thought that originate from outside Western dominated IR, which are now rightly being incorporated into the field. And as we move through the 2020s, International relations as a discipline is now grappling with new global level forces that are reshaping the international system. Now that we've raced through a quick fire reflection on the evolution of the modern state system, our Poll 1 SNS journey will move into the realm of international relations theories. The expansion of the IR theory family tree has been driven by these world events that we've looked at and the need for explanations for everything that happens in the international system and for prescriptions about how to behave and how to act and what to do as actors in that system. So with that in mind, exploring the IR family tree is your mission moving forward in Poll 1 SNS, should you choose to accept it.